Hi, my name is Trudy Styler. I'm making my directorial debut here at the Berlinale uh, in the Generation 14 Plus uh, segment of the festival. Um, my movie is called Freak Show and it's about a genderqueer teen who transfers from a liberal environment in uh, New York to a red state where he gets pretty bullied. And um, it's his story how he redresses his uh, detractors by running for homecoming queen. you say anything, you said after school I could be me, and this is me. You look awesome. Seriously? Four hours in hair and makeup, I've been preen, plucked, and boussied so tightly that my toes are turning blue and awesome. <laughs> no. I look atlantastic. Okay, atlantastic. Why'd you run away after class today? Hmm. I didn't run. I was chased. Oh. You're making progress, right? I mean, you're not getting beamed in the head as much anymore. Am I not? This is crazy. I'm compromising myself for reasons I don't even understand anymore. I need a drink. <laughs> Want me to hold your thing? Shut up. Hi, Trudy. Hi. Welcome to the Berlinale. We're Thank really you. happy to have you here. Thanks for inviting you me. You are here uh, with the world premiere of your first directorial debut feature film, uh, Freak Show. The premiere, the world premiere, took place yesterday, and I've heard it was very warmly accepted and very liked, very well liked. Uh, so, welcome. How did you enjoy Thank last you. night? Uh, last night was a, a real revelation because it was really the first, I mean it was the, the world premiere, it hadn't been seen by the public before, it's only had internal screenings um, during the making of it. And so to sit there with uh, more than a thousand people in the room who were really getting it and enjoying it and were laughing at the funny moments and were very moved clearly when mm -hmm. bad things happened to our hero Billy um, uh, so I was uh, I was I was very touched and very grateful mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us uh, a little bit uh, what the story is about who is Billy the main protagonist um, Billy is a genderqueer teen who transfers from a more liberal environment in um, New York to um, a red state school that is quite xenophobic and homophobic and very traditional conservative school where feminizing yourself is definitely not approved of uh, to the point where he's teased and then bullied and then beaten and then um, and so the way that Billy thinks about things uh, to redress the balance is uh, he thinks it would be a great idea to set out to become the school's homecoming queen. And uh, as you can feel, that the, uh, there's a great comedic element that runs through Freak Show, but at the same time it explores some, uh, some very big themes. And the, the biggest theme that, uh, that runs through the movie is, uh, is bullying. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a movie about bullying, uh, about a school that is not compassionate, not inclusive, and uh, Billy's mission is to put that right. Mm -hmm. But I understand it's not just comedy, but with every good movie when there is comedy, there is also a little bit of tragedy happening, maybe not in this film, but a little bit of drama. Oh, there's tragedy. It, I, I describe it as, um, as hilarious and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, so there's 
an accessibility, I suppose you might say, through the comedy uh, of Freak Show, but the uh, themes that it explores are by no means comedic. They are very big themes that we are struggling with, not only in our schools today, but within our countries, within the xenophobia that has sprung up, certainly in the United States of America where I live. Uh, we're seeing it possibly going to arise in France, in Holland, uh, in Russia, uh, everywhere. We are regressing with intolerance, not progressing. And I think that movies that explore uh, compassion and inclusiveness are are very important for today. Mm, I'm very, I agree with you very much. Coming from Poland, where it took that took a right wing uh, lately, uh, that's very close to my heart as well. But the film is being shown uh, at the in the uh, 14 plus generation here at the Berlinale, but it's not just um, a film for teenagers, is it? Uh, especially taking. Uh, those themes that are so well, this, relevant. The movie sets place in a high school, so I think in that way I was really happy that the film got into Generation 14 Plus. It was, uh, if I could have like closed my eyes and made a wish where I would see Freak Show after yeah. I'd made it, it would be at the Berlin Alley in this section. Because I, I do think in the end this is a message to schools and to teenagers. But you're right, it, it goes beyond, bullying goes beyond uh, high schools. I think mm -hmm. that it probably begins in childhood. Um, bullying is an ordinary evil. We see it every day in every environment that we live in, no matter what age. Being different, looking different. Um, I was bullied as a child at school from having a, had a road accident and having livid scars on my face. So when I went to school, I looked a bit damaged. I was also an LD kid. I had dyslexia and ADHD. So anything that sets you apart from the pack in mm -hmm. the school, you are right for bullying. Um, and then that can extend itself to the workplace and. Uh, 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 and everywhere. But Billy, uh, he's, uh, he has another take on it. He decides to fight for his yeah. identity and he refuses to exactly. wear blue jeans and uh, melt in the crowd. Billy is not a victim in any sense of the word and I think that's why we, the audience, sort of feel for him and ultimately love him. Um, even when he's beaten up badly, the first thing mm. he does is ask the doctor, could he have some lip gloss, please? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But the movie is uh, an adaptation of a book by uh, yeah. James and James. Actually, that's my question. Is it an adaptation or how did the writing process... Uh... So the movie is an adaptation, a yeah. loose adaptation from uh, a book called Freak Show written by James St. James, who ultimately became responsible for a, quite a famous movie in the 80s, called 90s, called um, Party Monster. Mm. And um, this was uh, loosely based on his days in high school. And the, the book is set in Florida, and our story is set in a fictitious uh, red state we never, we never say what, which city, which town, because I think to blame one and to exonerate mm -hmm. another wouldn't be, wouldn't be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that Billy has transferred from a liberal environment to a, a much more conservative one. Mm -hmm. And was James and James in any way involved uh, when you were working on developing the script for the movie? Well, I wasn't originally going to be the director, I was going to produce it. And then our director had a conflict with another movie and I asked the producers if, because I'd done a lot of work on Freak Show by then, I asked the producers if they would consider my directing it. And um, Drew Barrymore, who's one of our producers, was very encouraging about it, as were the other producers. And they said yes, um, mm -hmm. yes, that they, they would be very happy for me to take it on. Because you yourself are an actress as well. Yeah. Uh, how 
uh, where you have you always been thinking about directing at some point, uh, or was it because you just found yourself in this situation at that very moment that you had this idea that maybe this is the film for you, or have you been looking for a project uh, that you could work on as a director? Well, I think when when you sort of like ask internally what is missing in your life, some the universe opens up possibilities, <laughs> and. Um, I've been an actor uh, since I was 20, uh, and I still act. I was in two television series this year, and I think directing, you're using the same part of your brain as you are as an actor, it's a sort of very creative, uh, liquid, sort of like area of the brain, whereas producing is, uh, you have a mission to accomplish, that is to uh, look at the director's vision and help him or her express it. You have a budget and you, you, you from conception to birth, you are there with that movie. Um, and um, we have a, a platform, my, uh, my production partner and me, Celine Rattray at Maven Films, which is to give women more um, opportunity to act, produce and direct. There are 25% of women who produce and only 5% of women who direct. So I thought that I would set my hat out to, uh, to be a director after all these years of acting and producing. And how did that feel? Uh, it felt really uh, very peaceful. Uh, sort of like I, I got to a point in my life um, where uh, I'd like to be able to do the things that, uh, that I want to do that um, I've done a lot of, ha of hand-holding as a uh, producer. Um, you know, I've, uh, my first production company was called Shingu Films and it was a platform to, um, to help first-time writer-directors to get onto the ladder of, uh, of directing. So it was, uh, it was great to sort of like put myself with Celine and my producers helping me on the first rung of my own directorial ladder. Mm. Well, I think it went really well. And I also have this sense of the current days where I feel that more and more women actually take th things into their own hands and they re they're slowly realizing that we actually we can do the exact same things. We've been holding your hands, as you have said, for a long time and we're totally capable of doing this as good as you are. I totally, or even better. I, I, I totally agree. I think the women are great multitaskers, we have to be. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the need to be um, not just more women producers and directors, but also more women's narrative, I believe, and also uh, and more so more LGBTQ narratives mm -hmm. this is very important. You know, this is a world that is a very diverse world. We don't want the world to become more polarized. We want it to become more diverse. Mm -hmm. Which uh, your movie uh, clearly is uh, trying to achieve. I think uh, the, the main you. theme of um, you know, bullying and the tolerance and inclusive the gender issues. Uh, that's new in the cinema today, especially uh, in the context of teenagers and children. It's not been talked about as much as uh, uh, of adults dealing with those issues. So I think that's an interesting take on it. It's very new and fresh. And needed, much needed. And much needed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'd like to ask you how uh, you came across the uh, Billy, the actor portraying oh. Billy. Um, well, whilst I was producing it, uh, we met a lot of actors, uh, about a hundred young men mm -hmm. to uh, audition for Billy. We saw many, many. And uh, there were a lot that were really good, but the the, the role of Billy uh, is not just a central performance. It is the movie. He's only not in two scenes, and one that he's not in, he's listening at the door, and the other is he's being talked about. So he really never leaves our audience orbit. He's always always mm -hmm. present, and so to find an actor capable of this huge range of emotions that he has to go through um, from um, 
being put in a new environment where he's heartbroken, where he's uplifted, where he misses his mother, where he's angry, where he's... There's palettes of colours and within that, those palettes of colours, the nuancing that he has to because to, it's a 92 minute movie mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's in it for really most of that. So you need an actor of um, you know, immeasurable stamina. We had 22 days to shoot the movie, and in being in every scene, um, he, 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 this actor needed to really to be you know, ready, camera ready, ideas ready. And Alex, when I first met him, uh, when he came into the audition room, I flew to England to audition some guys um, in England. And as he walked into the room and apologized for not knowing any of the lines for his audition because he'd been busy learning his play, um, we sat down and he just read to, just like I was a character. And I knew that we had a synergy together that was going to work because it was important that we both had a rapport and uh, we got on terrifically well and um, I'm still in touch with him on a pretty frequent basis. I love Alex very much and I, I owe him a great deal. It's, I think his Billy is sublime. Mm. I agree. I he does amazing in the movie, so entertaining. But he expresses uh, himself very visually. Uh, the costumes in the movie are spectacular. Thank you. Uh, you've worked with some amazing costume designers uh, at this movie. Could you talk more about that? Because I guess it, it, uh, his visual representation was a very important uh, way to show his character. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm lucky in that one of my closest friends in the world is the costume designer Colleen Atwood. Uh, and my, my other closest friend, <laughs> who I've had Christmas with every year for 25, 22 years, is Milena Cananero, who's receiving the Golden Bear uh, Lifetime Achievement Award here. So it's not bad having two oh, great wow. girlfriends who are <laughs> the best costume designers. Um, so Colleen and I talked, um, she wasn't fully available, and so Sarah Lux was our second costume designer, who I think did a really great job of Billy's everyday looks. Um, and they worked together really well, and Sarah has worked with Madonna a lot, and um, you know, she has a very theatrical eye and works in theatre, mm -hmm. and she, I thought she did a, a really great job. And of course Billy's frocks and costumes are they're very important to him um, until he discovers who he really is and that he can find himself. And so I think in our story what we see is the more bedecked and the more bowed and glittered he is, uh, the less, whilst he's enjoying the flamboyance of that and feeling that that's him, when he starts to be accepted in his environment, he dresses in a very um, original, great way, but it's, it's less superficial and it's more organically who mm -hmm. Billy is. Um, and I think that the, both costume designers were able to make those transitions really well. Like the Billy that we see at the end, you feel, the, you feel that he's found peace with himself and there's a serenity that, uh, that, that comes from his eyes. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, the visual aspect of your movie, the pictures are uh, beautiful. You're a director of photography, the amazing uh, Dante. Uh, how did it happen that he uh, agreed to work with you? Are you close friends as well? Dante and I, when I was an actress uh, and doing a movie in 1987 in Cinecitta, uh, was a, a very odd movie called Fair Game about a young woman uh, locked up in an apartment with a deadly mamba snake. And, um, <laughs> uh, and Dante was one of the, he was a young uh, DP and um, I was the only actress on set. There was one actor who worked for three days called Greg Henry, and other than that, there was uh, a snake. And so it was a, a movie <laughs> very short on actors. So we became um, really good friends during the shoot. And then um, one day we had some time behind camera, and he said, 
a Trudy, do you think you'll always be an actress? And I said, oh, I don't know what's ahead. Who knows if we'll always be anything? But I said, I guess one day I would really love to direct. And um, he said, when that day comes, I will be at your side. And I said, promise? This is in 1987. <laughs> so when the producers agreed for me to direct Freak Show, um, I rang Dante, and, uh, who lives in Los Angeles, and I said, do you remember in 1987 how you said if I was ever a director that you'd be at my side? He said, yes, I do. I said, did you mean it? <laughs> so he said, when is it? <laughs> And uh, he really kindly um, stepped up, and I think he's done a beautiful job. No, brilliant. <laughs> uh, I must say that in movie, the movie, the cast, the uh, producers behind it, the director of photography, the actors, and the uh, score composer uh, are all brilliant. I, if I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were especially trying to get uh, Dan Romer involved yes. in the movie. I didn't know Dan at all, but um, he did uh, *Beasts of the Southern Wild* and mm -hmm. Carrie Fukunaga's *Beasts of No Nation*, and um, I thought that they were both unique pieces of music and how they really fitted those uh, movies brilliantly. And I called Dan and I said, this is a very specific story set in a high school about bullying and can we talk about it? And we did. And he, he read the script and he really liked the script. Um, and then we talked about what kind of music. And so, um, we talked about the music being organic to uh, the environment, which is what I think he did so well in Beasts of uh, Southern Wild and no, and no Nation. And so he went out and he bought a school locker, a school desk, and uh, used three pairs of his boots and shoes and created this percussive uh, music that we hear all in the school, um, in the school environment. And, and you really feel the high school through this sort of driving percussive sound that he created for, mm. um, for um, the Grant Academy High School. Um, and I think it works to great effect because it drives the narrative forward, but you also really sense the, like for, for Billy being in a hostile environment, where he's not accepted, where, you know, through this kind of like percussion, which is sort of like a fast heartbeat, that things can get tense very quickly for him. Mm. Trudy, I wish you every luck with the movie at the festival here. Fingers crossed for the Teddy Awards nomination <laughs> and also beyond Berlin and the Berlin Film Festival. It's been lovely to talk to you. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much. And thanks so much for inviting me for this interview and Pleasure. to submit for the Teddy. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.